<laughs> and thank you to Patrick for inviting me. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here in beautiful Vienna and in this uh, beautiful play uh, room to tonight. Um, and I was uh, really happy to meet uh, uh, your team and to have really nice discussions. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, so the, 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 the title of my presentation, as you can see, is uh, Environmental Hazards, Materialities uh, and Mobility Justice, Insights from uh, Tajikistan's Pamirs. Um, so, yeah, it's a great, great pleasure for me to, to speak about these uh, topics that I'm really uh, passionate about and about these places also I'm passionate about. So I'm happy, um, I'd be happy to discuss also uh, afterwards, so feel free to, uh, uh, to, yeah, to think about questions of, or comments that you, you want to discuss. Um, so my presentation today has uh, different aims. Um, first, I'd like to discuss uh, the mobilities environment uh, nexus and uh, what a mobility justice lens uh, can bring to uh, what we call the climate mobilities uh, scholarship. And in this regard, I think my presentation uh, will really connect with uh, uh, the presentations of uh, Mimi Scheller and Ingrid Boas uh, a few months ago he here in, uh, in Vienna as well. Um, and both of them, both uh, Mimi Scheller and Ingrid Boas, have really inspired my work. So I think you, if you know their work, you will really see the, the connections. And another aim of this uh, presentation is to, uh, to bring forward the importance of looking at infrastructure, logistics, and what some researchers have coined uh, mobile materialities or um, the material aspects of mobilities. Um, and because I don't want to be only theoretical in my presentation, I will also present the, this case study of my uh, PhD research on Tajikistan's Pamir Mountains. Um, and I will try to sum up um, some of the main, main fin uh, findings sorry, of my dissertation, but especially to, um, to, to present an article that I've published a few months ago. Uh, so first, um, let me tell you some words about my PhD journey and how I started to, uh, to explore these topics. Um, so my initial idea actually when I started my PhD in uh, 2016 uh, was to, uh, to explore environmental migration uh, in Tajikistan. Um, I, ha I knew Tajikistan before I had been there. Um, and I, uh, I had read that um, Tajikistan is often considered a very vulnerable country in terms of climate change. It's a, um, a country uh, mostly covered with mountains. Um, and, uh, but but it, it, despite being uh, so vulnerable, um, it, it's what we can call a, a blind spot of um, studies on environmental migration. So this is how I, I started to, um, to have this idea. But when I was uh, traveling there um, and during my first PhD fieldwork, it appears to me that um, the main concerns for, for the residents <coughs> I met were more um, issues of accessibility, of uh, road closures, um, which are um, often, not only, but often caused by environmental hazards, such as uh, floods in summer, avalanches in winter, and also rockfalls all year round. Um, and by, by simply traveling in the region, I think it was uh, quite easy to realize how these issues were um, um, constituted everyday difficulties for, for the people there. And, uh, and this is how my research uh, interests have moved from uh, environmental migrations to more um, uh, local scale mo <coughs> mobilities or um, and question of accessibility, but in the context still of, uh, of climate change. So regarding my, my methods, I have conducted an, what we could call an extensive uh, ethnographic fieldwork in a valley called the Bartang Valley of Tajikistan. And um, so I spent a total of nine months in the field. And um, during these um, 
this the field work I, I was sharing homes and daily activities with residents i interviewed them also and traveled with them um, so i have experienced trips in uh, shared cars uh, but also by bike or by foot or on foot and i have uh, observed and kind of sensed how all uh, forms of mobilities or at least many forms of mobilities are impacted by weather conditions or by um, geophysical hazards. So one of the central contributions of my uh, PhD research, or at least I hope it's a contribution of my work, is to emphasize the case of everyday short-scale mobilities in the face of climate change, and to show that it's somehow, um, this issue is somehow a blind spot in uh, environmental migration or climate mobility studies. Um, and I've also attempted to bring forward the issue of immobility. I think in the last couple of years, maybe it's it's it has get um, yeah it's getting more famous, more common to to speak about immobility. But I think uh, when I when I started my PhD, it was not so yeah not so popular. So I tried to bring forward this issue, and both in terms of um, involuntary immobility. Uh, with people enjoying low uh, motilities or low mobility capacities and um, kind of more voluntary immobility uh, with residents willing to remain um, because of strong place attachment, community resilience, for instance. Um, but I will not um, too much focus on this second point today and more focus on the, yeah, on the involuntary immobility. Um, so yeah, as I said today, I, I would like to present this article called, um, called Let's Hit the Road, Environmental Hazards, Materialities and Mobility Justice, Insights from, Pamir's, um, uh, from Tajikistan's Pamirs, uh, which was published as part as, of a um, special issue uh, in the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies. And this issue was coordinated by uh, Ingrid Boas and also um, Hannah Wiegel and Carol Farbotcom, some of, of you know them. And, um, and this intro was, was also, um, the, the introduction, sorry, to the special issue was uh, written by, um, by these research researchers um, uh, together with Mimi Scheller. So um, all, actually all the special issues um, uh, focuses on issues of, um, uh, of mobility justice. Um, so yeah, I believe the, um, the, this collective work, uh, this special issue might have been uh, uh, presented to you earlier, a few months ago by Ingrid and Mimi. Um, but uh, I would say that co concerning my work, uh, the general ideas were to emphasize uh, the material aspects of mobility and to develop uh, the idea that um, an analy analysis sorry, of mobility systems helps to develop a deeper understanding of uh, um, immobilities or mobilities inequalities and injustices in the context of, uh, of environmental risk and, and, and climate change. And it was also um, uh, an attempt at an invitation for researchers in the fields of uh, environmental and climate mobilities uh, to consider the impact of uh, environmental conditions on infrastructures, matter, and things that enable or hamper uh, human mobilities. So this article starts with the fact or the observation that climate change allows uh, new territories to be discovered, traversed or inhabited, but also renders uh, others inaccessible or inhospitable. Um, this is an issue that transport studies um, actually have uh, highlighted. Um, we can find in this field um, um, studies on the effects of flooding, on, uh, of erosion, landslides, avalanches, droughts, high temperatures, sea level rise, or heavy snowfalls on, on road conditions, on uh, maintenance or construction. Um, for example, um, we, we can find uh, studies showing that ice roads in the Arctic are melting and they can't be utilized the way they used to be. Um, also, the fact that the permafrost is thawing um, negatively impacts the road infrastructure and also the railway infrastructure, for example, in uh, northern Russia. 
um, and also the um, the increasing urban flo uh, flooding in many parts of the of the world challenges uh, urban transport systems and heat waves as, as well uh, affect roads and, dri and driving conditions in many countries. However, the, the, the point I'm trying to make in this article is that uh, mobility's research has mostly examined uh, the way mobilities participate in carbon emissions um, or the possibilities for transport systems to become more sustainable, less polluting or to adopt green technologies but not specifically on the other way around that's on the uh, meaning on the way climate change impact uh, transportation infrastructure so that's why i think the material or logistical aspects of mobilities uh, deserve deserve our attention and should be fully incorporated into the uh, climate mobilities scholarship so um, in the article, I, I develop three examples of the interrelations between disasters uh, or hazards, uh, transportation infrastructures and mobile, mobile lives um, that have been explored in, uh, in different studies. Um, so for example, if we take the case of urban mobility impairment, impairments, uh, we, which are, for example, caused by, by floods or storms, um, these uh, studies have shown that this can put uh, some communities in critical situations uh, since um, disruptions have impact on, for, for example, on the time spent commuting, on congestion, on the conditions of mobilities, and also on the risks associated to mobilities. And uh, often this also um, leads to inequalities because some social groups uh, such as low-skilled populations and sometimes women who are who have more uh, family responsibilities um, don't have uh, the same mobility options and are more um, heavily impacted by mobility disruptions. And the second example lies in the case of um, regions in high latitudes uh, where mobility infrastructures are threatened by the melting of ice and the thawing of permafrost. permafrost sorry. Um, so this means that climate change actually shortens the period of operation of these uh, of these roads uh, on which many small communities rely, um, and there is in a, in some case an urgent need to uh, to transform to adapt uh, these roads uh, to to new cl climatic conditions. Um, and uh, yeah, and as I, I mentioned before, the storing of permafrost also uh, jeopardizes uh, train lines in, uh, at high altitude and threatens some islands communities viability, um, as many, well, not many, but some studies show. Um, so this, there is really this question of um, attractiveness and habitability, uh, which, um, which are at stake for, for example, for some Art, uh, Arctic islands. And thirdly, um, the, I developed the case of mountain roads, uh, where riverine floods, avalanches, rock slides, landslides threaten mobilities and force uh, residents to find new mobility options and often to, to travel in, in dangerous conditions. So this um, short review uh, shows that there is actually a new geography of roads, infrastructure and mobilities that is taking shape and that uh, such changes means that uh, mean that um, uh, some translocal or multi-local livelihoods are threatened by this uh, decreased accessibility so if uh, residents are uh, less able to uh, to circulate or to live survive and cope with difficulties in this area um, yeah, we, can, we can see the, this link uh, i think between um, um, between mobility and uh, and dwelling, between living somewhere and being able to move back and forth. Um, so yeah, if populations are not able to circulate the way they used to be, uh, they should al adopt alternative routes uh, for their everyday activities to reach products, services, facilities, uh, and so on. So yeah, in other words, by affecting transportation infrastructures, uh, environmental hazards do not just impact everyday and local mobilities 
immediately after the disaster, but they may affect um, the accessibility of uh, some areas for longer durations. And consequently, um, this would limit the, the socioeconomic uh, opportunities of, uh, of the populations. Um, so that's why an, an increased frequency of hazards, such as floods uh, un under the effects of climate change, uh, may jeopardize the, the, the accessibility and habitability of, uh, of many areas worldwide. Uh, worldwide. So now that I have hopefully demonstrated the, the importance of exploring uh, mobility infrastructure in the context of climate change, I'd like to briefly discuss some uh, theoretical frameworks and concepts that can help us, I think, address the impact of environmental conditions on the mobility infrastructure. Um, so first, let's look at the notion of uh, material mobilities. Um, so Jensen, Ole Jensen, uh, who is an urban scholar uh, specializing in sociology and planning, um, explains the importance of studying the material aspect of mobilities. And he said we should turn to a material pragmatism and examine the, the immobile network that makes mobilities possible. And he says, he says that we should ask ourselves mundane questions so, such as what makes this mobile situation possible? Or, sorry, this mobile situation happen. So in his work, he, for example, for instance, mentions the importance of water permeable asphalt uh, that can uh, the importance such um, asphalt can have in the face of flooding. Um, so this notion of material mobilities invites us to rethink uh, many binary distinctions, for example, between human and non-humans, between subjects, objects, between culture, nature, and so on, and to embrace um, the material di dimensions of the social worlds we are studying. And uh, so I think this perspective helps to understand concretely where and how uh, the environment and infrastructure uh, interact. And this helps also to reaffirm the political, economic and cultural factors um, at stake when we speak about climate mobilities. And a second perspective that I have uh, found particularly inspiring and which is, I think, directly in line <clears throat> with the material mobilities perspective is the idea of following networks wherever they may lead um, and um, and by acknowledging that they are and here i quote uh, bruno latour that they are continuous path uh, from the local to the global um, so if we follow the political economic social human and non-human actants, actants is a Latourian term, uh, involved in the event of, a, for example, a destroyed bridge or a flooded river, we avoid, I think, making shortcuts between the weather event and the, and the impacts for the community uh, using that bridge. So this means that looking at the moments, at the places where mobilities and the biophysical world um, interact, um, and where, um, this is also a, um, quote, um, an expression by Latour that I like, he said that we should um, look to um, where the, the um, for example, where mobilities and the environment begin to have a common fate, you know, where, where they, they meet. And I think this helps to connect also the different mobility scales and to understand the value of, uh, of the local scale, even if we, if our idea is to address uh, wider scale mobilities. So yeah, this is really um, a way to connect scales and, and even to, uh, to, yeah, to, to, to realize how much, they, how much they are connected and sometimes how much they, they are blurred because we don't exactly know um, if we are still in the local or global scale. And thirdly, um, this attention to both mat material pragmatism and uh, networks, um, I think completely uh, resonates with uh, Mimi Scheller's mobility justice perspective, uh, which I quote, focuses attention on the politics of unequal capabilities for movement, as well as on unequal rights to stay or dwell in a place. 
Um, so the mobility justice perspective may also be adopted uh, in order to emphasize inequalities, lack of capacities, and relations of power in the realm of uh, mobilities. And I think this perspective helps, helps us explore how, uh, depending on their aspirations and capabilities, individuals uh, uh, working far away from home may choose between migrating, relocating, uh, daily commuting or multi-residency uh, with frequent circulations between places of residence. This is, of course, um, dependent on both aspirations and capabilities. Um, so I think this highlights the need as uh, Mimi Scheller advocates to address entire mobility systems, meaning to look at mobilities on different spatial and time scales in order to explore multiple mobility and immobility issues, uh, such as uh, people being trapped or unable to circulate or um, having to flee in the context of climate change. Um, and I think yeah, this shows that um, uh, local or short-term mobilities and, and the impossibilities, uh, the impossibility, sorry, to realize this kind of mobilities may actually impact other forms of mobilities of longer uh, durations or on um, longer temporal scales. And uh, as yeah, as brief, briefly said before, for Mimi Scheller, um, uh, mobility justice is also intrinsically connected to the right to dwell, and, and it also helps to examine the, the case of population wishing, uh, the, wishing to stay uh, despite environmental risks. Um, and this is why uh, I think this mobility justice perspective helps uh, foreground power asymmetries and, differ and differentiated uh, mobilities in the case, uh, in the context of disasters. So I think these three uh, frameworks um, are really important if we, if we aim to focus on how socioeconomic vulnerabilities are formed or transformed by, by mobilities um, and how people may get trapped or, um, or why they may, they may be coerced to move uh, even though they, they aspire to stay. So all these issues I think are uh, encompassed in the, uh, in the mobility justice framework. Um, yeah, and, and when I was talking about po uh, power inequalities, I think in many studies we see also in, in, in the context of disasters, why some social groups can move, can escape while others can't. And so, yeah, this is also um, where I think looking at materialities at, and following networks can, uh, can, really, um, yeah, can really help us. So let's now move uh, to Tajikistan's Pamir Mountains uh, to attempt to exemplify some of the, of the ideas that I have just presented. Um, so in the Bartong Valley, where I've um, conducted fieldwork, uh, there is only one car road, uh, uh, which is frequently uh, unusual, um, on some portions at least, uh, because it's blocked by uh, rockfalls, landslides, floods and avalanches. And um, residents are often reminded of the, uh, how the materialities uh, of uh, mobilities uh, can um, can determine the feasibility of a trip. Uh, so I, I, we can see clearly how the biophysical elements bump into the, the materiality of infrastructure and objects also and also into objects such as cars, um, vehicle, different vehicles, but also the bodies, people's bodies, and how this, um, these hazards can make journeys impossible or at least physically challenging. Because sometimes it's not that it's impossible, it's just that it's impossible for some uh, groups of people because it's very physically challenging. So um, the road is often blocked for some hours or days, but also sometimes for weeks or even months. Um, for example, in, in summer when the, the, the level of the river is particularly high, um, or sometimes in winter also when uh, huge avalanches are very hard to clear. And um, old four-wheel vehicles, who, which are often in, uh, in poor conditions, or here you can also see a Soviet minibus, um, they are also severely impacted by uh, hazards 
um, and their maintenance uh, puts a financial and logistical pressure on, on drivers. Um, and these environmental conditions uh, often compel residents to undergo uh, difficult and uh, dangerous trips, uh, for example, as you can see on the pictures, uh, by walking in the river uh, when uh, the road is flooded or to cross um, avalanche, uh, avalanche corridors, for instance. Um, so, of course, the, the, this, this doesn't mean that, um, that the problem is only uh, environmental or climatic. This is never the case. Um, so these weather events, these biophysical events, collide with a mobility system that is already ve very vulnerable. Um, and here, for example, in this context, we, ca we can say that the uh, mobility system is constituted, um, among others, by car availability, uh, by the price of the seat in a shared car, uh, which is expensive for, for most residents. Um, and also it depends on the road conditions, uh, which can make the, the journey, um, the journeys more or less uh, possible and more or less dangerous. And it's important also to know that in the whole province, so in a, it's a big territory, much bigger than the Bartang Valley, there is no public transport um, at all. So these environmental hazards uh, collide with a vulnerable mobility system uh, and limit people's abilities to circulate. Um, and, but however, many products, services, such as healthcare or banking facilities, universities, and, and many more, um, and also incomes, uh, are available in towns and cities uh, to which residents, of course, have access to rural urban mobilities. Um, and here I, I wanted to briefly add uh, that during the Soviet times, um, there was a provisioning system in the region, it was called the Moscow provisioning system, uh, and it, it enabled um, mountain villages, even very small mountain villages in, in this valley, for instance, to be provisioned um, with the most uh, common good, uh, goods and services. Um, and also some residents told me how they, they used to occasionally um, travel with helicopters, uh, uh, for example, from the valley to, um, uh, to, to the city. Uh, actually, th there, there was not a lot of helicopters going, but for example, some helicopters would come and um, deliver food products and they would, uh, they would have some free seats on the way back so people who could, uh, uh, could use the helicopters. Uh, but nowadays, there, there is no uh, such option. So when the road happens to be blocked by floods, avalanches, rock slide, um, this inaccessibility poses a threat to food security and also um, highly um, or severely uh, limits socioeconomic opportunities. Um, and even, um, and you know, we will see it in the next slide, but even if residents attempt to repair the road, um, they usually operate with very limited means and in dangerous conditions, uh, so they can't ensure the, the accessibility, the openness of, of the road, uh, only with their own means. So by posing or by increasing such threats to, to livelihoods, these disruptions, these mobility disruptions, put into question um, the habitability of places uh, such as the Bartong Valley, and also the, of course, the capacities of the residents to dwell um, when when they can't realize um, they can't yeah, practice these uh, um, essential mobilities. So in Bartang, like in most places, these low um, mobility capacities or motilities are felt differently by different social groups. Um, as I yeah, mentioned before, and for example, many of my female interlocutors told me that um, in case of adverse environmental conditions, they avoid going to the city because, um, they, because they don't know when they will be able to come back. Because when, for example, in summer, when you, you see that the, the level of the river is slowly um, increasing or, or in winter when it's snowing a lot, you, you think that, okay, I'm going to the city, but 
I don't know when I'll be able to, to come back. Is it after days or weeks? So, so mostly women told me, we, in this case, we, ca we cannot afford to leave uh, uh, the house for a long time and we can't risk actually being stuck. So we prefer not to go. So this means that low motilities um, prompt or force residents to make choices between job opportunities and family commitments, for instance, or between resettlement and long absences and separations. And um, because of this inability to circulate uh, on a regular basis, um, the most mobile um, members of households, such as students in the city, or ter tertiary sector workers in Dushanbe, the national capital, or also tourist guides or uh, also labor migrants to, to Russia. They often leave home for long periods because they can't uh, also they can't afford to come back regularly to, the, to their village. Um, and this is, uh, of course, often experienced uh, as a drawback or and as a fragility of uh, the, these translocal livelihoods. Um, and uh, because, of course, we know that uh, these uh, translocal or multi-residential arrangements require good connection uh, between places and are based on the high motility or high mobility, good mobility capacities of, uh, of the, the people concerned. And uh, for, uh, I wanted to, to add here that at the, um, uh, regarding this capacity to, to, to move and to, uh, to dwell. Uh, at the end of my field work in uh, 2020, I remember that um, a woman told me, uh, she told me how much she was attached to her valley, but also how hard life was in this valley. And she told me it would be good if our houses in the valley uh, would be like dachas, like um, second homes, like countryside homes, so we wouldn't have to um, uh, to face all these everyday difficulties, but still we would be strongly connected to uh, to this place that we love and that we don't want to leave. So I, for me, it was a good um, illustration of uh, of this. You know that uh, you, you the, the perfect uh, for these women, the perfect situation would be to just go back and forth between the the city and the village. But she knows that it, it's not possible. It's just not possible to to do this regularly. Uh, so yeah, I believe this example of uh, Bartang of Bartang Valley helps to understand the value of uh, studying this uh, entire mobility system. And it shows the way the, the material disruptions uh, can impact multiple kinds of, uh, of mobilities. Um, and here we see uh, how this focus on materialities and networks can, can also foreground inequalities and, uh, and, and it helps us understand how the, the right to move and the right to dwell are connected. So uh, yeah, in other words, we can say that um, in, that in terms of how these scales are entangled, um, when we take the, the, the case of a, a disaster, uh, we see that the disaster is physically localized. It's, yeah, it's quite clear that it's happening in one specific place. Uh, it blocks the road on one or uh, one specific portion, but the consequences of this disruption can be felt in, in, in longer, uh, longer term mobility or immobility. Also. So here comes the conclusion. Um, so I hope this presentation has helped to understand, understand the value of studying the, the practicalities of everyday and essential mobilities and why it needs attention uh, under climate change. Since the, the way a road is constructed, maintained, exposed to environmental disasters and the capacities and resilience of, uh, of vehicles, of people, of uh, yeah, their bodies, uh, <coughs> sorry, deserve the attention of uh, environmental mobility scholars because they all play a, a role, I think, in this environment mobility relationship. And as we've seen in many areas of the world, um, transportation infrastructures are being damaged, destroyed, or at least becoming seasonal, uh, seasonally seasonally unusual uh, under the effects of global climate change. Um, that's why the cases of ice roads, 
urban floods, uh, coast roads also, or mountain roads, uh, deserves to be, to be explored. And the nexus between accessibility and habitability, or between mobility capacities and translocality, um, also need to be examined uh, in order to, to reconnect different scales, to reconnect the right to dwell and the right to move. Um, so I think all these issues uh, really, um, sh really show uh, uh, how mobility justice and uh, climate justice meet. Um, so that's why I believe that this at attention to uh, entire mobility systems and to materiality infrastructures and conditions um, also force us to, uh, to ask ourselves um, why studying climate or environmental mobilities really matters. Um, when, when people are forced to move after a disaster or when they are unable to find a safe place to relocate, or when they are trapped in a place exposed to, to, to environmental stress. Uh, these are all issues of uh, mobility justice in, in which the right to move and the right to dwell as well are not secured. And I will stop here. <laughs>